Praise the Lord. <clears throat> Praise the Lord. It's always good to be in the house of the Lord. It's always good to be able to come in and praise God and worship God and be thankful for what he's done for you. You know, wh whenever these opportunities arise where you can come up and, and, and share what God has done for you throughout the week, throughout your life, you know, testimonies are so powerful because they are making a declaration that God has done this for your life. You know, I think one of the biggest things we have to remember is that God has a plan for your life, and you never want to forget that. Right. You know, uh, e even if it seems like, man, I don't know, God, I've messed up things. Oh, I don't know, man, I, I'm, I'm going the wrong direction. You know, the, the one advantage of Facebook is that they do put on some things that make you think. And they do put on scripture on there. A lot of people do put scripture and, and prayer requests. And that's what I love about it. if you have a prayer request, man, you can put that on Facebook and and you have your Facebook family, that will pray for you. And, and one of the things that, that got to me was a, a friend to put this on here, and I want to start with this one here, because if you think you've blown God's plan for your life, rest in this. You, my beautiful friend, are not that powerful. You are not more powerful than God, and God can still turn around. We, you know, we think about Abraham and how that in, in Genesis 12, when, when, and God told him now in Haran, the Lord said to Abram at that time, go, uh, go for yourself, for your own advantage away from your country, from your relatives, your father's house, the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation. I will bless you with abundant, with in, abundant increase of favors and make your name famous and distinguished. And you will be a blessing dispensing good to others. And I will bless those who bless you and confer prosperity and happiness upon you and curse them who curses or uses insolent language towards you. In you with all the families and kids of the earth be blessed and by you they will bless themselves. Now, let, let's take a, just, just a, a, a look at that. And we know it took a while from getting to that point to finally to where the blessings came. It took a, it took a point. And we know that it, uh, Abraham was going to have a child. And Abraham and Sarah, you know, they, they, they had this waiting period. And one of the biggest problems we get into when God says he's going to bless us is patience. Patience is probably the worst thing for some people. You can always tell impatient people when, when you go out to eat and they have to go get their own soda. Because those are the ones that stand in the line and, and figure out, what am I going to have to drink today? You know, and they go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. I'm saying just be like a kid and get them all, put them all, and make the soup out of this drink. You know, we, we, we really are getting a little thirsty now. Can we get something to drink? But, but, you know, sometimes in God's plans, sometimes we get impatient. And God says, you know what? Let you, if you just trust me, so many times in the Bible, that's what God, that's the only thing he wanted. So it, 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 as, as we look into the Bible a little farther in the story, and I'm going to skip over to Genesis 16. It says, now Sarah, Sarah, Abraham's wife, had borne no children. So what she said, look, we had got this Egyptian maid. We know how they went down to Egypt, and God didn't tell them to go down to Egypt. And we know that that's a, a story in itself. And they got an Egyptian maid whose name was Hagar, and they said, I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what, Abraham. This is what we're going to do. You go ahead and take her as a wife, and maybe that's the way God will bless us with a child. Maybe we'll go through her, and we'll get a child. That's not what God had intended at all. Okay, And we know that there, there, she did, Hagar did get pregnant, and then there was conflict. Oh, I, mean, I can imagine. Now she got pregnant, and, and, and that should have actually been me, and there's a lot of jealousy in there. And so they had this big argument. Abram, at that time, he's still Abram. He didn't really help Hagar very much. You know, do what you want with her. And Sarah and her got into it, and, and Hagar took off. Now, this is the point. Hagar, only thing she thought, she was from Egypt. She took off, and it's, it's interesting to note, but Abraham said to Sarah, this is verse 6, See her, your maid is in your hands and power. Do as you please with her. And when Sarah dealt severely with her, humbling and afflicting her, she, Hagar, fled from her. She fled off. But the angel of the Lord found her. 
found Hagar by a spring of water in the wilderness and the road to Shur. And Shur was on the edge of Egypt. So the only place she knew was to run back home. Okay? Now, this is what I love. This is what I want to get to. And, and he said, the angel of the Lord's talking. He said, Hagar, Sarah's maid, where'd you come from? Or where are you intending to go? Were you going to run away? You're going to run away from the situation? And, and, and she, he's talking, angel of the Lord. And he said, I am running away from my mistress, Sarah. And the angel of the Lord said to her, go back to your mistress and humbly submit to her control. Also, the angel of the Lord said to her, I will multiply your descendants. You're still going to be blessed, because I haven't forgotten you. So that you should be, uh, not be numbered for multiple multitude and the angel of the Lord continues see now you are with child and you should bear a son and should call his name Ishmael Ishmael name means God hears okay I love that God hears because the Lord has heard hallelujah the Lord has heard and paid attention to your affliction and and think about that just just think about it. God hears where you're at he understands the cry of your heart you never want to forget that, folks. Never want. Sometimes in the midst of our pain, we wonder if anybody hears, if anybody's concerned about what I'm going through. Well, we're here to tell you today, yes, God understands, and God hears. And, and so many times, if we look at the, 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 the different names of God, if we look at Yahweh Rapha, you know, the God that healeth. We look about, think there's times you need healing in your life. Like, there's times you need provisions in your life, times you need that God just to show himself mighty in your life. Well, today, what we're going to do today, we're going to praise God and worship God because God has never failed. He has never failed you, and he never will. That's one thing I love about God. You know, he has a way of coming through when it looks like there is no way. People often say, <clears throat> they say, Tim, they, they get to the point of Tim, but I don't know which way to go. I do not know which way to go. Man, I, it's, it's like I'm at a, 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 a T intersection and I don't go to right or left. You know, I don't know which way to go. I said one thing. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You can't go wrong by following him. How are you going to possibly go wrong following him? Okay? You can't do it. You can't do it. We all have decisions, that, and, and, and Wednesday night we was here, and I, I appreciate everybody who had um, uh, 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 prayed for the, the uh, her name was Lavola, had prayed for her, and when they had prayed, and, and, and a lot of people was praying for her life, she went through a lot of things, she had uh, some, some brain issues, she had bleeding on her brain, and God brought her through that, and then her friend died the same, the next week she got out of the hospital, and all that stuff fell on you, and you wonder which direction to go. But she did the right thing, and we was praying, and she received the Lord Jesus Christ yes. as her Lord and Savior. Yes. Okay. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If that's what it takes sometimes yes. to get you down to your knees, then people said, people said, oh, Tim, oh, Tim, man, I come to the end. I come to the end. I can't take I come to the end. You are always tell them, that's good. And they, I get about that big. How can you say that's good, Tim? I come to the end. Because Jesus said he's the Alpha and Omega, yeah. the beginning and the ending, yeah. so he came right up to him. Yeah. Sometimes it's good to go down to the bottom because there's only one way to look, and that's to look up. Amen. And that's what we need to do in Christ. Oh, we need to always look up. We need to never forget him. One, one, of, the, one of the things that, that, like when Hagar ran off, I'm sure she's got all these thoughts, is thinking that, man, what a mess. There's no way. God hears and he understands, and, and then there's God, the angel of the Lord, right there. And sometimes when we think God won't meet us there, that's when he meets us there. And sometimes what we need to do is just listen to that still, small voice. To your God. And God says, just stop. You know what we need to do? Stop running. That's what we need to do. Stop running, fall to your knees, and cry out to God. Because he heard. He heard. And he's hearing me. I know in this room, I'm sure there's some prayers. There's some needs that we've been praying for and praying for. And the old timer, when, when we went to church, you know, we, we didn't have a time frame. I mean, you know, if, if people had to stay at that altar, we tear. You said, oh, it's called tear down to altar. And there'd be somebody with them. And we're praying till we break through. That's the way the old saints used to pray. They, they would lock arms. That's the old term. We'd lock arms. What is it you need for life, God, to change in your life? 
There's always something. We always have a need. But I tell you what, I always believe those needs get met a lot faster when we just kind of, there's nothing wrong with going to God and bringing the needs to him. Absolutely nothing. There's nothing wrong. But I tell you what, it's also nice to just take a day and say, God, you know what? Today, I'm not bringing you any requests. I'm not going to bring you one single request today. You know what I'm going to do in my prayer time with you today? I'm going to spend that prayer time thanking you. Mm. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to thank you and praise you for what you've already done. Amen. I'm going to give that time because God's already aware of your needs. There's nothing wrong with asking him. But let me tell you, people who have thankful hearts, God wants to show himself mighty. Yes. He wants to show himself big. Yes. He wants to show himself. You know, that's one thing I love about God is that, you know, you know, some people think we've got to we got to approach God in, in a certain way. Certainly, we ought to be reverent, reverential to God. There, there's nothing that's good. But you know, we don't have to have a certain language. We don't have to have a certain way other than we come to God. And sometimes you're in such a state, all you can do is moan and groan before God and fall out before Him and let God know where you're at. And you want to touch. Sometimes we need a fresh touch from God. And I'll tell you what, the one thing I love about God, I always get a picture. I always get a picture of God, just like if, you, if you, you hold a little baby, and you hold that baby, and you're rocking that baby. The Bible talks about Zephaniah, where he talks about he rejoices over us for singing. And you know when you get a picture of that baby, and we was, we was at the store the other night, and this baby was crying. I mean, just, I don't know what the deal was, but you feel like just going over and, and just, you know, holding that little baby and just, and just rocking that baby and telling that baby, it's going to be all right. Yeah. It's going to be all right. We're here for you. What God's telling you today, he is here for you. Yeah. He hears you. He loves you. Yes. You know, and he wants the best for your life. And every single person in this building, God has got a plan. And if you feel it's got messed up, nope, he still can make it come through. And sometimes it takes a long time. I tell you what, you look at Moses. Moses for 40 years, you know, and, and, and he was trying to do God's plan and didn't quite come out the wrong, right way. And then he fit 40 years on the backside of the desert. And I'm sure those 40 years, that first year, that might not have been too bad. But that first decade, where's God? Oh, man, did he forget about me? The second decade, where's God? Oh, man, maybe he really forgot about me. Third decade, you know, and he's just out there. And I said, I don't know what happened. I'm sure there was a lot of questions. But oh, that fourth decade. Now Moses is 80 years old, right? And and, and and the burning bush experience happened. You know, and, and, and he turned aside. He Wait, what's going on here? There's God. Yeah. And you know what God said? Wherever God is, it's the same way today. Wherever God is, it's holy. Yeah. He said, you know, this is holy ground. Why? Because God's here. That's what makes it holy. And, and tell you what, God's here today, yeah. and that's what's going to make this place holy because God meets us here. Yeah. And he's yeah. going to meet us here, as, yeah. a, as they say, at the mercy seat. Yeah. He's got whatever you need right now. Yeah. And that's what we need to believe God for. Yeah. Remember today, folks, yeah. God hears. God yeah. hears. Yeah. God yeah. hears and he understands. Yeah. Hallelujah. So we're going to open this up with prayer today. I ask you to pray for a friend of ours that got in this situation. This is one thing kind of led a little bit to this too. And, and he feels that he's blown God's plan. He said, no way. Because the Bible says, Romans 8, 28, all things, yes. all things work together for the good. Yes. Those that love God, all things. Yes. It, hallelujah. Hallelujah. All things, not some things. You know, and, and they can work together. We just got to believe God. You know, one day, and I know I, I share some of the same things, but I'm telling you, if they're still in your heart, you share it. Like a pe preacher once told me, says, Tim, you always preach what's big in your heart. What's always big in your heart. What's always big in my heart is God's going to come through. That's what's always big in my heart. And one thing, you know, I was thinking about, you know, like God says, you nothing's impossible to God. And, you know, it's like, I'm thinking, boy, this situation, and, and, and it's like God was speaking to my heart, Tim, I deal in the impossible. Yes. I deal in it. Yes. And the Bible says, yes. 
Is there anything too hard for God? What does anything mean? X out of means. Is there anything too hard for God? No, what? So whatever situation you're dealing with, nothing's too hard for God. He can change it in an instant. All he asks you is just believe. Because he's already done it. We're already going to claim it ahead of time. Because God is same yesterday, today, forever. Talk about Jesus Christ. Same. He's the same God. The same God that healed in the then the Old Testament, the same God's healing in the New Testament. Yeah, he's yeah. still healing. He's still yeah, delivering. Yeah. He's still changing lives yeah. today. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. All right. We're going to open this up yeah. for prayer requests. If I go, if I don't, because I keep going. Question. <laughs> Pastor. That's right. Yes. Yes, that's what we're going to do. We're going to pray. Because God's still the healer. He's still more than able. His name is above every name. And that's his name is above cancer. His name is above that. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Someone else. Yes. He's able. Amen. He's able. He's more than able. Yes. Makes us more than conquerors. Okay, John? Yeah, a friend of mine at work, uh, he and his wife were having issues and uh, requested prayer for their marriage and their lives. His name is Reuben. Her name is Daisy. And uh, he, I told him, like you were saying, you know, thank you for Hallelujah. And that's a, and that's what we have to look at. Yes. You know, God, God's bigger. I know, I know, you know, Tammy Faye Baker, she always sang that song. I, I just love it. You know, God is bigger than anything. Yeah. You know, and that's what we always got to do is lift God up. God's bigger than our trouble. He's bigger than our trials. And sometimes people build a trial up and think it's bigger than God. You know, how can, you know, we used to sing that song. He's got the whole world in his hand. And, and always remember, he's got the whole world in his hand, and he ain't going to drop it. He is not going to drop it, okay? You were created for a reason. All the things that you're going through, it's not a surprise to God. Some people think that God somehow goes to sleep or something, you know? And he wakes up, and, well, God, how can we didn't know? I know. I know what's going on. All I'm asking you on your side is just to believe me. And, and that, that was always, when you look at Jesus walked the earth, it's like he was always wanting people, if they just believed, right. if they would just believe, that's what he wanted. And, and that's why he was always, it was almost not, not that he's shocked, but he was so surprised when somebody dared to believe him. Right. I mean, we always think, we look at, look, at, look at Peter. I mean, you obviously can't walk on water. Jesus, Jesus said, come, mm -hmm. you know. Now, Peter did take some steps. That we, we know that. But then he thought, wait, we, we, I can't do this, yeah. you know. <laughs> I, can't, I can't be walking on the water, you know. And then he cried out, and Jesus saved him, you know. And he come, why'd you doubt? Yeah. You know, who was he walking to? Right. That's the difference. He was walking to Jesus. Right. And if you keep your eyes on the Lord, that makes all the difference. Yeah. The problem is we get off here, we get off here, and we look at the circumstances. Jesus is above the circumstances. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. Yes. So, Roberto.
Right. Because my brother, everything that happens that is not what he's expecting, he sees it as an attack. Mm-hmm. Yes, we'll definitely pray. And that's what the church is for. Yeah. Right. You know, where there's two or three touched and agreeing, God's in the midst. Yeah. Yes. And that's what we're going to agree, that God turned those situations out. He's not the author of confusion. Right. Right. You know, he's, right. he, he's the author of peace. And, and so we're we going to look at that, right. that, that God can provide peace and change those situations. Because that's what I love about God the most. You know, when, when they was getting ready to attack a, a, a Elijah and all the, you know, the chariots had come down, you know, in the service. And what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Man, I mean, this looks bad. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and God, you know, Elijah said, God, just open his eyes. Because he needed to see spiritual eyes that there was more that was with them than more that was surrounding them. Right. And he opened up and he saw all these chariots in the heavens. Amen. You know, that God's army. You know, God has his army out there. And God has, God has so much for us. Right. And if we can only get a picture of what God is doing for us right. every day, how he protects, how he's moving. Right. Uh, one time my uh, 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 son-in-law was, was wanting to teach me to play chess. And I said, well, y'all take too long. You know, chess <laughs> takes too long. I'd rather play checkers because we can get through. But, you know, but I'm watching. They had a chess table, him and his friend, and they was up there playing chess, and they not moving, you know, not moving to pieces. I said, what, what's going on here? We're thinking. We're thinking. You know, checkers, we'd have a game done before they got one move, you know. But he's thinking, he says, Tim, you don't understand. One thing about chess is we're not thinking about just the move we're making now. We're thinking about moves farther on. If this person does this, I need to respond here. So there are two or three, four moves down the line. And it hit me when I said, that's the way God hit God's the grand chess master. You know, the devil can't beat him. The devil's lost. He's already lost. He can't win because we're on the winning side. 
we are and always remember that we are on the winning right. side. Amen. You know, a lot of people say, well, you know, God, God came up and, and, and God, God hit a home run in this situation. You know, God really came through. You know what I tell people? I said, no, not only did he hit a home run, he hit a grand slam right. and he brought everybody yes. home. That's what God did. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. Yeah, come on. Praise the Lord.
That's right. Because it's a broken um, joy like of the love, aren't yeah. they? Right. Like people and the things that that matter and look at our suffering and encourage us. Right. The Bible tells us to think on these things. Yes. Yeah. That's right. That which is good. Yes. That's right. Yeah. our very present help. Yes. Very yes. present help. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. I think God's trying to tell us all something here because we experienced on Friday. I mean, and it's news. The enemy will use anybody to bring this fake news if you, still, if you want to say to your life. And I think sometimes I forget that God is in me. Right. He's not right. far off and we're waiting right. for him. He is in us. Yes. Hallelujah. So, so the enemy, all he can do is deceive you with the things around you. And he brought to my husband's attention yesterday about the spies that went out. They went out, only two came back and believed that they could take that land. He's wanting somebody to stand girded and believe him at his word. That's right. So I think with what you're saying and what Suzanne just shared, it's like, what do we believe? Are we going to walk the walk that we've been talking for so long? Yeah. What are we going to believe? So I'm just, he encouraged us yesterday. If I don't care what the situation looks like, it will line up for our good. That's it right. will line up for That's our right. good because yeah. God is in me. He That's is right. in me. There's nothing else that can happen but good. That's right. right. So that's what we're standing on and what God has put into our path is you're going to stand and you're going to believe yeah. or not. That's right. So anyway, it's, well, and it's really easy. It's simple. Yeah. <laughs> we did that. So, yep. amen. Yes. church on Easter Sunday and have a dress for the baby and everything, so her heart is really to, you know, raise that child in the house of the Lord and get him on, on board with her, so we'll just keep lifting him up in prayer and thanking the Lord for, you know, he's given Mike the strength to do this on his own. Um, my physical therapist uh, saw a Bible story book that I read to her that's 30 years old, some of you guys remember these old Bible story books, and so she started talking and just kept looking at it. So we stuck up a conversation, and uh, I said, so do you go to church anywhere? And she's like, well, I was raised, she's from the Philippines. I was raised Catholic, then my mother turned to Pentecostal. What a small world. So we started talking about, you know, just the Lord and speaking in tongues and just the experiences she's had and whatnot. And she says, I don't know if it made me better or if it made me worse. It was EPC. <laughs> and... Uh, I said, well, you know, it made you better, I'm sure, because it taught you good principles and disciplines and different things. She says, that's true. But they're not going to church anywhere. She was living with a seven-year-old and a 23-month-old and her husband. So I invited them, you know, to come and visit us. And she says, I've been to some other places, but it's just too quiet. After you've been to Pentecost, it's like, yeah, no, this isn't where it's at. (laughs) So I don't know, but, you know, again, I just feel like, Whoever the Lord puts in our path, right. everyone has a purpose and a reason. Right. I mean, she's been coming for, what, three weeks now? Yeah. And we just finally, why 
wind up on the subject. So anyway, I start um, probably working with this hamstring muscle, which we haven't done at all yet this week. So just pray. I mean, I know I'm not supposed to be bearing any weight, but I have no pain when I bear weight. So I've kind of been kind of cheating, but I don't feel like I have because I feel like the Lord's done the work, you know. So, uh, so hopefully the surgery's not going to be mad, but I am using wisdom. I'm not being stupid. But, um, you know, as you guys are all talking, it's just, I was thinking, you ever go through your old pictures and, and remember when we had to have our old camera and we say, man, I wish I had a camera. We pull it out and we totally miss that moment. And now sometimes I do that. I was trying to get some pictures of her and just, just that little bit of time and it was gone. That moment was gone and I didn't capture it. But you know, the Lord never, like you said, never misses a moment. He knows uh, every never moment does. of our life. Never you know, does. We may miss it by just a millisecond second or whatever it is but the lord knows everything and he never misses a second of our life and uh you know wherever everything's going i'm just continuing to trust in him this physical therapist says can you uh can you take more clients so i don't know what the lord's going to do i mean i keep thinking i'm going to give this up because i don't feel like at the moment i'm making any profit because i'm giving everything away to people to keep the business going but at the same time uh, she's like, Sheila, I, I have so many people, and I never know where to send them to. So so I, I'm just, again, saying the Lord's not missing a millisecond of my life. He knows where everything's going, and he's got it all planned, and, and I can worry, and I can stress, but it doesn't do any good. It doesn't change the situation, so it's all in his hands. So I'm so glad he never misses a second of our life, and like Sue Thompson always says, he's an on-time God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's true. Yep, we, we always, uh, you know, in uh, the old show, Father Knows Best. And I always think about our Father Knows yeah. Best. Hallelujah. Yeah. He knows what's best. So if you would, let's uh, stand for prayer, please. Hallelujah. 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 Father God, we thank you. We come into the house to praise you today because you are so worthy of praise. Oh, Father God, we thank you that you see us. We thank you that you hear us. We thank you our deliverer. Oh, Lord. Holy Father, wonderful Father, mighty counselor, mighty God. You are more than able. Hallelujah. You are more than able. Is anything too hard for God? Nothing more. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You are the God of impossible. You can do it all. Hallelujah. You are the way, the truth, and the life. Oh, Father God, I ask you to be with Alvin's knee, that you would touch him right now in the name of Jesus. Touch him from the top of his head to the sole of his feet. You are more than able. Anyone in the building that needs healing, Lord, you are the God that healeth. Lord, we ask you to touch him today like the woman uh, that, that stretched out. So if I could just touch the hem of his garment, just touch, I would be made whole. Lord, that you would make people whole today, that one that needed today. Lord, we thank you for bringing those back in the house that's been gone. That, that, that We thank you for Cindy being here. We thank you for Sheila, how you're touching our life. Oh, Father God, we thank you for my we thank you, Lord, for working in those situations. When it looked like, oh, it may look like dark times, uh, but you are the Father of lights. Uh, there's no shadow. There's no shadow with you, Lord. Oh, Father God. Lord, we ask you to move in Roberto's situation, his prayer request. Uh, Lord, with his sister and his family, you are more than able, Lord. It's all about in the beginning, God. Hallelujah. That you are there. You are there. That, Lord, those that we pass pass through our lives, Lord. Lord, let us reach out and touch them. Let us say that you can never talk to the wrong person about Jesus. Oh, Father God. Oh, Lord. Lord, this mic has been five days sober. Lord, just take that whole desire away. Oh, Father God. You are more than able. Lord, I thank you for working in James' situation. Oh, Father God. We thank you, Lord, for all your goodness. We thank you that, Lord, even in those difficult times where it doesn't seem that we can make it through, we already know 
that you are present, God, that you are there for us, that you have a plan for our life. Hallelujah. You have plans to give us a future and a hope. Oh, Father God, we want to thank you today. Oh, we thank you for your everlasting love. Lord, we thank you, Lord, that for your forgiveness, that you have forgiven us, Lord. We thank you for your son, hallelujah, that took all the sin upon him, Father God, once and for all. Father God, we thank you that, that our prayers go above this ceiling. They go all the way to the throne room. Oh, Father God, every need that's represented here today, Lord, we ask you to meet every single need. Because, Lord, you are more. You are more than able to meet every need in a spectacular way. Because we serve a mighty God. Hallelujah. An awesome God. Hallelujah. 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 Bible says, I will bless the Lord at all times, at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. His praise, not my complaints, not my worries, not my strife, but his praise shall continually be in my mouth. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Oh, God is so good. God is so good. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, it's an announcement. Uh, if you have a cell phone, please turn it off or turn on to vibrate, vibrate. Thank you so much. Uh, we have our Eastern Gate House of Prayer on March the 10th. And Mike, come on. Yes, uh, we're going to be gathering. Uh, last uh, month as we gathered, um, we felt like we came up against a wall. And uh, naturally, the Lord uh, rises up a standard against those things. Uh, we didn't understand quite what was going on, but Those that were here, uh, encourage you to come. Uh, there are situations where even the uh, current administration in Washington and stuff like that, you know, I understand there's people upset and everything else like that. But when I start seeing the realms of witchcraft and uh, demonic activity uh, being proclaimed that they're going to rise up and they're cast spells and da 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 some of this is fake, but I'm going to guarantee you a lot of it is real. All right? Who's going to stand up? then the watchman on the wall need to cry out. And I'm hearing and I'm seeing watchmen on the wall crying out. And us being the eastern gate of the city uh, has been prophesied by people from other prayer groups around this region uh, that we're seeing things first, all right? And as we see things first, we need to be like a watchman on the wall, calling these things out to the rest of this city so they can be ready. I'm getting responses from Mason City. I'm getting responses from, from Ankeny, uh, other prayer groups diligent, be vigilant, take the sword of the Lord, uh, let's further the kingdom of God, we'll have a time of prayer, we'll have a time of worship, and celebration, we'll have communion, and we'll pray for needs of anyone who comes, everyone who comes and needs prayer, we'll be praying for them. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. And then following that, the next day, strategically, uh, there'll be a 12 hour prayer burn up at Ankeny at the Heartland Church, um, Eastern Gate House of Prayer will two-hour sessions going on from 9 o'clock in the morning till 9 o'clock at night, continuous worship and prayer. We're not backing off. We're not backing off. Um, <clears throat> Rick Arrowwood um, is happy because we weren't able to make the last few, but he's happy because uh, he, says that we, he says he loves it when our worship team and the prayer people that come with us bring the fire. Amen. They want the fire. They need the fire. They love the fire. Uh, it's almost like a uh, tank of gasoline just sitting there waiting for a rain to get thrown in to explode. Yeah. So in the standing, we're linking arms, we're linking hearts, and we're linking yeah. spirits. So I need those that, yes, are on the worship team. Most of the worship team is able to make it, thank God. Uh, but I also need the prayer people to go up there with us and stand with us. Because the, as, as we go through our prayer meetings here, there'll be times with people coming up to this, this, this home.
podium and these fire things with the Lord, the worship team will support that, okay? If you've ever seen two birds chasing through the sky, one chasing after the other, the Lord showed me this back in 1995. As the people that are leading prayer, proclaiming things, leading on out, they're not alone. The worship team will support right on behind. No matter where you go, in the valleys, up in the mountains and stuff, I said, you chase them in the spirit realm and worship. Time has been set. Yes. Time is now. Thank okay. you, God. Thank you, God. Praise the Lord. Now let us speak the word. Yes. Will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? I am a believer, and these signs you follow me in the name of Jesus. I cast out demons, I speak in new tongues. I lay hands on the sick and they do become. Christ has redeemed me from the curse of the law. Therefore, I forbid any sickness or disease to come upon this body. Every disease, germ, and every virus that touches this body dies instantly in the name of Jesus. Every organ and every tissue of this body functions to perfection to which God created it to function. And I forbid any malfunction in this body in the name of Jesus. I receive the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of my understanding being enlightened, and I am not conformed to this world, but am transformed by the renewing of my mind. My mind is renewed by the word of God. The Lord rebukes the devour for my sake, and no weapon that is formed against my finances will prosper. All obstacles and hindrances to my financial prosperity are now dissolved. The Lord has pleasure in the prosperity of his servant, and Abraham's blessings are mine. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Brother Ron and Eric, come up and take the offering for us, please. Rest and be seated. Brother Eric, would you pray, please? Father, we are so blessed for this day. I thank you, Lord, for the great mercies on me each day. And because of you, Lord Jesus, we are righteous. We are sanctified. Lord, that's true. Lord, have your way this through today. We know you will. Bless this offering.
Thank the Lord for what he's done here already today. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. So if you had a need, and you just need to claim it now in Jesus' name. Amen. You say Jesus' name. That's If you're born again, that name is... It isn't that we say Jesus' name every time. It's that that name has authority. Yes. You've been given authority. Yes. That's why we say in Jesus' name, it's the authority of Christ yes. to deal with whatever circumstances you're faced with, whatever the enemy brings against you. You have Christ in you. Yes. You and Christ are one. You have Christ's authority. You are an heir and a joint heir with Christ. You need to speak it out. Yes. Amen. Oh, every time you just... This has happened. You know, we, we receive yes. by faith. Yes. Yes. Now, that doesn't mean, we also know that the enemy comes to steal the word. Yes. The minute God gives you a word for something, for your healing or for your de deliverance, you know the enemy's going to come. You can just write it down. He's going to come and try to give you some false evidence that says that isn't happening. So you take your authority, Jesus' name authority that he's given you. His name is over you, praise the Lord. You and he are one. You take that authority and you rebuke the lie of the enemy and stand on what the Word of God has promised. Amen. It will come to pass. It has to come to pass. In fact, it already came to pass. It's just a question of whether or not we're going to see it manifest in our lives. So you've got to be stubborn. You've got to be bullheaded. You've got to hang in there and just continue to confess God's Word as the final Word. And it will manifest in Jesus' name. Give the Lord a hand clap. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you, Karen. Thank all of you for being up here this morning. Praise the Lord. Appreciate it. All of your testimonies and prayer requests. And let's just call it done in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. Our worship leader. John's escorting her back to her seat, but <laughs> praise the Lord. It's good. Nothing more, nothing greater to than see just a little babe like that and how the Spirit of the Lord, you know, you think, well, it's just a little kid playing. No, they're in the presence of the Lord. They're, they're experiencing worship, and it has an impact. We don't know how and, and how all that works, but you can't, be, you can't be here and involved in this kind of worship. Amen, without having it impact. And we've seen it with our own grandkids. They don't have to understand the theology of it. They just need to get in the presence, right? Thank the Lord. Amen. All right, God bless you. The Sunday school uh, children and young people can be dismissed. God bless all of you for being here this morning. Appreciate it. And as they make their way downstairs, we're going to go <clears throat> to the Word of God. I'd like to start, uh, Roberto and John, book of John chapter 14 and verse 20. And I'm kind of staying with this, uh, this theme because I really do think that it's, uh, it's important. Not that just we have, you know, head knowledge of this or intellectual understanding in terms of, you know, we can read this and okay I get that I understand that's what he's saying but it's another thing when it becomes a part of us when it really gets down inside of us and it becomes a way that we live our lives and the way that we then respond to situations and circumstances and Jody was talking about it this morning and, and it's true for all of us you know we we are one with God in Christ 
You know, if you think about all of the chaos, all of the problems, all of the hatred and bitterness and biases and all of that stuff across the, I'm just not talking about here in the United States, but I mean around the world. that has gone on for millennia. Now, it isn't like it just happened in our generation. It's been going on since man's been on this planet. And it's the failure to see one another as Christ that perpetuates this junk. Now, that's just the bottom line. I'm not saying there aren't wicked people and people that do bad stuff, but people are just people. They're either going to be they're either going to be uh, controlled or uh, impacted and uh, moved on by God or by the enemy. It's just the way it is. And, and it doesn't matter who they are. It's just the fact. The truth is, us, even us, filled with the Holy Ghost, we can be, we can be moved on by the enemy. We can't, be, we can't be possessed by the enemy, but we can sure as the devil... Be moved by the enemy. Yeah. Just take a trip down, you know, 235, about 730 in the morning, and you'll feel the presence of the enemy really quick the first time somebody pulls out in front of you or tries to cut you off or doesn't let you get in. And You know, I mean, look, that's just the fact. We live in a world that is... There's, there's demonic spirits, there's forces, there's all this junk in the world. And I'm not saying this to scare you or to put the focus on him. I'm just saying he that's in us is greater than he that's in the world. Yes. But to think that people aren't influenced by spiritual uh, entities is to be just completely ignorant of the word of God. So we need to be totally focused. And we're talking about living in the now, or as Suzanne was talking about, being right today. Can't do anything about tomorrow. Or you can't do anything about yesterday. And, to, and tomorrow's not here yet, so we don't really know what's coming there. All we have really is right now, this moment. Right. And we spend all of our time worrying and, and feeling bad about what was, or worrying or fearing about what might be. We lose the one thing that we do have, and that's the now. Right. Well, God is the God of the now. Yes. Right? Yes. So, I don't, it doesn't matter what happened yesterday. Somebody didn't get healed. Look, I'm sorry, but I'm not focused on that. I'm focused on the now. God's healing now because God's here now. Yes. Tomorrow, if we need healing, we'll deal with tomorrow, tomorrow, because God will be there. Right. The, the issue is not only are we in the now, but God is always in the now. And, be, and the, the reality is because God's in the now, he's in us. Yes. We only live in the now. I'm not living tomorrow. I, tomorrow, I, I'm not sure I'll be here tomorrow. I got a pretty good plan for tomorrow, but it could change just like that. So I need to recognize that I and the Lord are one, and we're one right now. Praise the Lord. If I, you know, one of those freaky little scary prayers that are parents used to teach us, if I should die before I wake, that'll put you right to sleep, won't it? If I should die before I wake, you know, I pray the Lord my soul will take. It's just another way of saying to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Well, I'm present with the Lord all the time. It's just that my body isn't always aware of that, right? The more we are conscious of that, the more healing, the more deliverance, the more breakthrough in every area of our life will manifest. Because where God is, Whatever the need is, is there as well. Yes. See, healing isn't a thing. It's, a, it's God. God is healing. God is deliverance. God is prosperity. He's, he is all of those things. So he can be in this room, in us, in each one of us, and I have need of healing. I get healed. Alvin needs a financial breakthrough. He gets his financial breakthrough. Yes. Somebody else has got a relation that's just relationship that's all fouled up. They can get that healed. Yes. Others are in bondage to things that are just they struggle with and struggle with, and, and they can be broken off. Yes. It's not, you know, because one person prayed this or one person. It's God. God's able to do all of this in each one of us, amen, as our need demands or requires. So when we pray, it isn't so much the words, and I mean, I understand that, but most of the time our, our words just end up getting in the way. Because we feel obligated. I, you know, uh, when I was 
doing some evangelizing and stuff years ago, you know, you pray and you just feel like, wow, you know, you're, you want people to be inspired or to be moved. And it's just like saying, well, man, what an anointing he has. Why? Because he's really loud? You know, or because he's very charismatic? Look, I, I, I look at Jesus and only with a couple of exceptions do I ever see Jesus even raising his voice. Yeah. He is the anointed. Yes. I mean, come on. Every one of you that I'm looking at right now, and this goes for all believers, you are anointed. You have the anointed. Yes. There's not some other anointing coming. You're not, I mean, you can spend all your life praying for some special anointing for something. You're just wasting your time. You either wake up to the fact that you already have the anointed one, and you are one, Amen. So you've got every anointing you need. You just need to wake up to it. You just need to act on it. And so if there's a difference in Christianity between Christians, it's just that some are aware and some aren't. It isn't that some are more powerful. He doesn't give some measure of the Holy Spirit. You either have it or you don't have it. All the fullness of the Godhead dwelt in him bodily, and we are complete in him. So we got to get past this stuff of get the right person come pray, you know, and everything will work out. No, you are the right person. You're the perfect person. Yes. Praise the Lord. Yes. And so you just need to realize it. You need to realize. And this is the reason also for why grace is so important. Because we know ourselves. The only one that knows us better than us is not our spouse. Because we even keep some ugly stuff from them. Ancient history, you know, bad you know, feelings, ideas, thoughts come and go. We don't say everything, I hope. Not if you want to stay married very long. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Yeah. But I'm just saying, God is the only one that knows you better than you. Right. And he likes you better than you do. Yes. That's the freaky part of it. You know, we know ourselves. And so we, there's some of, uh, 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 parts of us that we don't like. And we get frustrated with ourselves because we can't fix what we don't like. And then we get angry at everybody else. Because you can only stay mad at yourself for so long. It's called depression. So you're either going to trust God and believe that he understands it all and loves you. Crazy love. I mean, love like you can't, that you can't imagine. So that you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. So that you can be the healer in the room when there's no other believer there. Amen. When you can be the deliverer, in spite of all your human flaws, because God is perfect, and he's right here. Praise the Lord. Okay, so look at this, John chapter 14 and verse 20. So if, you, if you ask me, now I'm, I, I'm, I'm grateful for every revival, every awakening every movement that has taken place in Christianity because for the most part they've moved us forward or closer to a, a oneness with God. The problem is it always ends up being about us. It always ends up about being somebody instead of God. And then it falls to pieces and we all get discouraged and disgusted and start pointing our fingers and wondering what happened. See, we, would, we are to have a continuous reviving. We have eternal life in us. We're supposed to be being, you know, the scripture says, though this flesh is perishing or dying, the spirit is renewed day by day. Yes. Praise the Lord. Yes. So it's, you know, it's getting pumped up. It's getting powered up continuously by the presence of God. And that's where we need to have our focus. Okay, so at that day, what day is that? That's the day that we're living in. Because if we go back a couple of scriptures, which I won't just for the sake of time, but he just he's, he's talking about, you know, I'm going to the Father. I'm sending back the Spirit. When the Holy Spirit comes and dwells in you, which is just God life, God's Spirit, God's Godhead comes to you. At that day, you're going to know that I'm in my Father, and you're in me, and I'm in you. Because we're all one now. So for most of us, it's been years of trying to be close to Jesus. Special services so we can get closer to Jesus. I'm not against any of this. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that's bad. I'm just saying this is what we've done. 
we've struggled and struggled to get close to Jesus. But now, according to him, according to Jesus, trying to be is replaced with abiding him. Instead of trying to get closer to God, how about just resting in the reality? See, it's a, it, it, it takes a change in the way that we think. Because the reality has been the same all along. The fact is, God has been in us ever since we've been born again. He's been one with us. He's been totally accepting of us. It's us having a problem with us and therefore projecting that onto God and saying, well, if i got a problem with me, surely God has a problem. He, but he doesn't. He says, just abide in me. And the fruit or the authority will manifest. So we need to become aware of the right now reality of our being in Christ. And by that, being one with God. If something, you know, or somebody is in another person, that we say things like, uh, those two are in relationship. Or maybe a little better, we'd say they're, they're in harmony. Better yet, we'd say they're, they're, they're in union. To be in someone and have someone in us isn't just close. It isn't like Alvin and Carol sitting next to each other here. They're close, but they're not in each other we know they are as husband and wife, right? But I'm talking about as two bodies, two physical bodies here. We're there in relationship, right? They're in harmony. More importantly, they're in union. And to say that about somebody or two people isn't about them just being close. They're closer than close. It's oneness with that person. That's what we talked about. Marriage is a metaphor like for our relationship with God. Yes. Two become one. We are the bride of Christ, right? So oneness with Christ is the central truth. And this is, this is the point we've got to get established in our minds and our hearts. The oneness that we have with Christ is the central truth of the entire doctrine of salvation. Yes, yes it is. Praise the Lord. Not just its application, you know, like the cross, but in the once for all finished work of Christ. That is, if we, we throw out all the other stuff I was talking about Wednesday night, we can major on this doctrine or that doctrine or this aspect of salvation and all of those things. But the truth is, it's just one. We, we have to get the focus, amen, not on this application, that application, but it's in the finished work of Christ. Even now we think, well, we think of the finished work of Christ, that's healing. No, it's salvation. It's sozo. It's oneness yes. with God. That's what salvation is. Yes. It has united us once again, one more. We're back one with God. That is sozo. That's completeness. That's what he said. You are complete in him, meaning that we have healing. We are healed. We are delivered. We are prospered. We just got to know it. We just have to be aware of that finished work. Yes. I don't have to go seeking for a healing. I need to just wake up to God in me, and healing's already here. It's yes. flowing all the time. It's always flowing. It's God. Yes. Everybody that came to Jesus got healed. How about this? He's in me. I don't have to go somewhere to get healed. I got to just wake up to the fact that he's here. Yes. Touch the hem of his garment. Man, I... I just got to touch, and I'm healed, praise the Lord. If I realize it, I make contact. I'm one with him. It's mind-blowing, you know. But you're as close to God as you can possibly get. No, I don't care how many. And we ought to have all the church services we can. We, ought, we want to, you know, make ourselves aware. We talked about this. Suzanne and, and, and Mike and, I, and Sally were talking about this after church Wednesday night. That's what we're doing in worship. It isn't that God is, is, is here now more than he was before we all started praying. We're just more aware of it, right? We just are conscious of it because we've been focusing on that. 
And it's true, we could go through our entire life. God could be as powerful or more powerful in the, you know, the makeup aisle at Walmart, yeah. amen, that he, not that I spend a lot of time there, but, you know, <laughs> there as he, as he is right here yes. or anywhere. Yes. If we were just focused on that, if we were yes. just conscious of that. Being made one with him in Christ. You don't get closer. John uh, chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. And we all know the scripture. This is a guy, a very religious guy, a Pharisee, who's talking to Jesus and basically he's saying, you know, what's the deal here? We know you're a teacher from God. He's wanting to get closer to God. He's frustrated because his religion hasn't really done that for him. And so he says, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. We know the Pharisees yeah. were the most religious, uh, rule-keeping group of the day. Paul said he was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. Yes. He was like the dot of the I's and crossed the T's of all these rule keepers. But the same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. For no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? He's wanting some rules. He's wanting just give me a three-step program or something that I can do that's going to get me closer to God. His... His motive is right. He wants to be closer to God. But his method is all screwed up. And he's wanting Jesus to validate the method that Jesus came to overturn. So he has, he's kind of like the, and I'm not making fun of songs here, but just bear with me. He's kind of like, just a closer walk with thee. Granted, Jesus is my plea. Right? That's his Kind of his theme song. Well, look at John chapter 3 now, verses 5 through 8. Just a closer walk. How many, we all sung that, you know? It's a beautiful song. And we get it, you know? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. The wind, he's talking about the spirit now, the spiritual birth. The wind blows where it listeth. And you hear the sound of it, but you can't tell where it's coming from or where it's going to. So is everyone that's born of the spirit. It's another way of saying the spirit comes and it, it, it exists in the right now. You don't know where it came from. It doesn't matter where it came from. I mean, where it was a minute ago. Right. It doesn't matter where it's going to be 10 minutes from now. All that matters is it's with you this moment, right? right. So how about they're singing this song, an old Aerosmith song. <laughs> he told me to walk this way. Praise <laughs> the Lord. Yes. <laughs> Amen. Walk by faith. Yes. Walk in the Spirit. See, we're wanting a closer walk with thee, and thee is telling us, just walk, man. Yes. You ain't getting any closer. Just walk this way. Just walk in the spirit and you won't fulfill the flesh. The flesh won't be your problem. The, 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 the symptoms, you know, the, the bad report, the negative response, the, all of the, they, they, won't, they won't have any authority over you. You'll be walking in Christ. You'll be walking in the authority. Just walk that way. Praise the Lord. You don't have to worry about it. Walk in the spirit. Walk in Christ. Hallelujah. All right, Ephesians chapter 1. That's, that's all my golden oldies for you this morning, praise the Lord, unless someone just happens to come into my mind. Ephesians 1, chapter 5 and 6. Ephesians 1, 5 and 6. And I, I want to show you some things that maybe, maybe, it's talk, maybe it has you know, been a deal for you and maybe it hasn't been, but because it has been at times for me, I assume that it probably is for somebody besides me. I'm not that unique. Okay, so having, a having predestinated us in, 
unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. Now, it almost sounds like a contradiction if you live in the 21st century America. Maybe that's true everywhere. But I was adopted, and this isn't a sob story. I come from a really good family. And my adopted father wasn't a very, uh, you know, touchy-feely kind of guy, but he was a very good provider, very uh, intent on integrity and that sort of thing. Uh, but he wasn't, you know, he wasn't like, get up on my lap and I'll tell you a story. That never happened, okay? But he was my adopted father. So when I hear adoption, I don't think the same as I think of me loving my kids or grandkids because I never experienced that. And again, this isn't, you know, this was a long time ago. So, you know, I'm not rehashing old things. My dad and I got along okay, but it wasn't a, a love thing, right? Mm -hmm. That's what adoption kind of, that's the signal that I get when I hear adoption. So religion has given us, many of us, this impression that God adopted us. That means he's, he'll, he'll take care of you. Yeah. He's responsible for you. He feels that responsibility, but that's all. He doesn't have any real kinship for you or doesn't have any real desire to, to be close or, or loving. Right. Just he feels a responsibility, and he's going to maintain his part of the bargain. Right. Amen? Right. So that's kind of where a lot of people, I think, come into this idea of, well, we've been adopted into the body of Christ, meaning we're like, you know, the red-headed stepchild. We're in there, but we're not yeah. that well liked. Yeah. yeah, I mean, pick your metaphor, but you know what I'm saying. All right, look, uh, let's look at this, uh, John chapter 1, verses 12 and 13. Because this is what we should be focusing on. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God, born of God. Right. So it's a whole different kind of adoption thing we're talking about. He, what we think of as adoption and what God's talking about here are two different things altogether. Yes. God chose. Yes. See, this is something none of our parents did. <laughs> In hindsight, it's 2020, but... Uh, my parents were both deceased, but I got to tell you, there had to have been times for my mom when she really probably had a second thought about that few minutes with my natural father that ended up producing me, because <laughs> I was a real pain in the butt, not just at birth, but later. You know, I, I, I was problem. So I'm thinking she probably had th thoughts where she thought, if I could just not have ever known him, you know what I mean? You know, because you can't give them back. Once you got them, you love them, and no matter what. But if I could have just not known him, is there any way we could, like, have a trade or something? You know, return, you know. Okay, so this is really all about me this morning, praise the Lord. I've got a lot of issues, and if you, if you knew me, you'd know that, praise God. But born of God. See, the Father himself has chosen and called you. Now, none of our parents chose us. They chose romance. They chose love. They chose the passion. And maybe they wanted to have children, but they didn't choose you. They just, whatever, it was a fig and a poke. You know, it's what they get. We make love, and nine months later, we, we got a baby. Wow, look at that. They, they may have wanted a girl and got a boy. Might have wanted a boy and got a girl. Amen. They may have wanted something, different personality, whatever. But they got what they got. But God chose us. Yes. God knew us before we were ever yes. anything. And he yes. said, that's the one. Yes. That's the one I want. Yes. Right? It's like when you go to the hospital and you look in the window and all these babies, and you, you know, they're, you're trying to figure out which one's yours until they finally wheel it back up there. You go, whoa, well, you know, the first one I saw really looked a little more developed. And, you know, but okay, I'll take it. But God knew and chose. Yes. So we think of adoption like Orphan Annie, you know, or like us. But 
in Christ, you're a child of God. Not only legally, but really. Yes. Really born of God. Yes. And not only was it just a moment of passion for God, which he's very passionate about you, but it was a, it was a design. He designed you to be what you are, who you are, where you are. And he said, that's good. That is really good. That's what I've been looking for. That's what I'm wanting. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Now, we have a problem with that, but God doesn't. He doesn't make mistakes. I know that's cliche, but it's a fact. He does not make mistakes. Yes. In Matthew 3, 17, you don't have to go there, Roberto, but it's where Jesus baptized, and the Scripture says that God speaks, and they hear his voice, and he says, This is my beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased. In other words, this is the Son that I love, and I'm really happy about it. Yes. I'm really happy about him. Yes. Who's the one he loves? Jesus, right? Where do we become God's children? In Christ. In Christ. My beloved son. That's why I can say that. That's why I heard that when I was praying that time. Because in Christ, I am his beloved yes. son. It's not, he's not looking at Jesus and seeing me. I'm in Christ, yes. and he sees me, and I'm beloved. Yes. Very same for you. Romans 8, verse 15. And I've got a lot of scripture this morning. I'll, I'll try to move as quickly as I can, but I want to keep the scriptures in here to keep everything in context so you don't just think I'm on a rant here. But this is Bible. This is what God is trying to get across to. This is so fundamental to everything else that we desire. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you've received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Daddy, Father. That's Abba. I never called my dad Daddy. Not even when I was little, four or five years old, because he wasn't Daddy. He was Father. <laughs> you can't get the, what I'm talking about. Praise the Lord. Respect, honor, it's all good. I'm not, I don't have a problem with that. We shouldn't do that. But there was not the intimacy. There wasn't the, the closeness, the daddy stuff. Praise the Lord. So the Father's an affirmation of Christ's sonship. My beloved son, I'm well pleased. His acknowledging that, and with all of its privileges, all of its rights, is ours. It's ours. We don't have to ask for it. We don't have to beg for it. We don't have to plead for it. It's already ours. Yes. Yes. See, I'm, I'm saying, and I've talked about this for a couple of weeks now, maybe three weeks or whatever it is. But look, we can take this even further and go to what the church itself, us. Not just us individually, but us collectively. We're, we're not going to get there until we get our thing right. So that... Jesus, his stuff is my stuff. His relationship is my relationship. That directly applies to everybody who's been united to Christ yes. by grace. Yes. Praise the Lord. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 21 through 23. First Corinthians 3, 21 through 23. Therefore, let no man glory in men. This is what I was talking about at the very beginning. For all things are yours. You can't, why should we be glorifying somebody else when everything's ours? Yeah. He doesn't have something you don't have. Right. That is right. He may have a bigger ministry, but that's only because you haven't stepped out in faith and done it yourself. Right. Yeah. Because all things are yours. Yeah. Whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death. Look at this. The world not just the, these three big name preachers, but the world, life itself, or death, or things present, or things to come. They're all yours. Why do we worry about the past? Why do we worry about the future? It's all ours anyhow. And ye are Christ, and Christ is God's. Yes. Praise the Lord. Yes. How else could it be, really, if you think about it? To be united to the Son of God by the Spirit of God and somehow not be a full and complete son or daughter of God yourself, would be the same as denying the sonship of Christ. If you deny your sonship or the fact that you are a daughter of God, 
You have to deny Christ to do it. Might explain why we don't get all the stuff that we're praying for sometimes. So being a child of God isn't just a legal act, but it's an intensely relational, intimate, and personal fact in each one of our lives. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 1. 1 John 3 and 1. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Praise God. What manner of love. Behold, look at this. What manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called sons of God. So it's not surprising the world doesn't know us because it didn't know him. All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26. And, I'm, and Roberto, I want to read, and I don't know how much of a problem that is for you to f- jump chapters, but I'd like to read uh, 1 Corinthians 1, 26, which is through the end of the first chapter and then into the first two verses of chapter 2. Does that make sense to you? So whatever you got to do to do that. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 26, and we'll go right through chapter 2, verse 2. So for you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh. This is some of my, this area is some of the best, my favorite scriptures. Because I just see Nathan everywhere here. (laughs) You see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And base things of the world, and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, but of God, by God birthing you, you're in Christ Jesus. Who of God is made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. That according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. That will change your entire perception and conception of every Christian that you interact with if we were to apply the same truth. Because that's how God sees them. He doesn't just pretend. He doesn't put on his Jesus glasses and just see Jesus. He just sees you because you are in Christ. He sees you. He doesn't see Jesus. He sees you in Christ. He sees you in the finished work of Jesus. He sees you in the authority of the Christ Almighty. Praise the Lord. And he says, I'm I'm well pleased. I love you. Amen. See, the main benefit, in fact, the, the supreme benefit of being united to Christ isn't that we share his authority or that we have his anointing or that we are righteous or that we are forgiven. It's the fact that being united to Christ gives us the grace by which we are now completely and forever included in the family of God as true sons and daughters of of God, in the beloved. We've made it about everything else. We've made it about, I need, oh man, if I could just get the anointing. If I could just lay hands on the sick and see, if I could just get this breakthrough, if I could just get this. Look, those things are all good, but the purpose, the supreme reality here is that we have been united to Christ and by grace we cannot be taken away from it. We cannot be diminished. And so therefore we have access to all of this. Praise God. Praise God. In fact, being a child of God is the most real thing about you. Woo! Let me say it again. 
Being a child of God, having eternal life is the thing, the most real thing about you. This is going to go like everything else is temporal. It may seem real for the moment like that pew is, but it's just a bunch of molecules and a bunch of atoms spinning around. And if I was in the spirit, if I no longer had to deal with this flesh, I'd go right through it like it wasn't even there. Just like Jesus went through walls. The most real thing about you is the fact that you and Christ are one and cannot ever be separated. It's eternal. It's not temporary. It's not momentary. It's not for a while. It's not till your next screw up. It's for eternity. It's what defines every part of our being. Not the color of our hair, not the color of our skin, not the bank account, not the car we drive, not the house we live in, not our intellect, but that we are one with God. That is what defines us. That's why Paul, he understood it. In fact, he wrote it. And he said, that's why I'm telling you, I'm not seeing nothing but Christ. Because that's the only real definition that there is for you. That's the only defining way of describing any one of you is Christ. See, because of the, the theology of, of religion and adoption by extension has created this life that is just riddled with fear, fear that will be abandoned, fear that he might stop loving us, might stop providing, might get up one day and just say, hey, I don't want to mess with it anymore. Because after all, you're just adopted. And the result becomes legalism, moralism, or worse. John chapter 16, verse 27. For the Father himself loveth you because you have loved me. And I believe, and excuse me, because you've loved me and have believed that I came out from God. Praise the Lord. So the Father loves you because you believe that Jesus came from God or that Jesus is God in the flesh. Right? right? All right, look at uh, John chapter 20, verse 17. <laughs> Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father. But go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father and your Father, Amen. to my God and your God. Equal. He's my father, but he's your father. You're just my younger brother. You're just my younger sister. Same father. Only when we wake up to our union, our oneness with God, can we really have any clue what Christianity is really about. God's complete, total focus is on you. So, well, that's, that's just egotistical and self-serving. And No, it's, it's what God said. Yep. You know, I, Sally and I, uh, between the two of us, we have nine children. We have one. I should have said it this way. We have one between us. And among us, <laughs> we have eight more. I have four from a previous marriage. She has four. So we've got nine kids and just a boatload of grandkids. I think it's like 28, 27, 27 grandkids and four, I think four, uh, three or four great grandkids. And, I, you know, the challenge of parenting is to make each child feel like they're the favorite without hurting any of the others at the moment you're trying to make them feel like the favorite, right? How many of you, you know? That's it. I mean, that's the, that's the big deal. Unless you just have one child, and then you were smarter than the rest of us, praise the Lord. But, um, or had more self-control, I don't know which. But anyhow, we, you, you try to, you want each one of them to feel like they're special. Each one of them to feel like they are the, the favorite, the most important, the most valued, right? 
Look at Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 through 19. Ephesians 3, 14 through 19. For this cause I bow my knee unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth, length, depth, and height, and to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. So God's love is not, it doesn't operate as a sum total. In other words, each child of God is the most loved of God's children. It's what we want to do, but in cap- what we can't do. Because we're finite, because we're here. But God can. That's why the inspiration for us, if we really love our kids, is to do the same thing, but we just can't. We end up screwing it all up because we'll have jealousy and sibling rivalry and all kinds of other stuff if they catch you. And believe me, they will. If you tell them you're my favorite, they're going to go tell the others I'm the favorite. You can just write it down. I haven't done that, but I know that's the reality. So I'm just saying God can do this because he's God. He can, you, Karen, you're his favorite. But I don't have to be jealous of Karen because I'm his favorite too. Amen? We're each unique. We're each different. But she can be his favorite. And I can be his favorite because he's in her and he's in me. All of him is in her. All of him is in me. It's, it's, I'm saying it's crazy, but it's the way it is. You say, well, but, but yeah, that's fine, except that, you know, Jesus is immortal. Jesus is eternal. He's sinless. And we're mortals. And how can God love us? Because we do sin. And how can he love us as much as he loves Christ himself? That is what's so crazy. That's what's so outrageous about our oneness with Christ. Right. Yep, the liver came through. Praise the Lord. God's love and acceptance of us is based not on individual performance or privilege, but on the individual person of Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13. Told you I had a lot of scriptures, but I'm I'm moving along here. Praise the Lord. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bound or bond or free, have been all made to drink unto one spirit. All right, Philippians chapter 2, verse 2. How are you doing back there, Roberto? As my old friend used to say, I think he may have carpus tunnel. I mean, it's carpal, but... Uh, Fulfill ye my joy that ye might... That ye may... Excuse me. Fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love being of one accord, of one mind, sharing the same love between the Father and the Son. Yes. See, the, in fact, the, con- the real contradiction would have to be for somebody to be joined to the person of Christ and then somehow claim that the Father loves Christ more and loves them less. Mm-hmm. Amen? Based on Scripture... We, we've, we've thought that to be the reality when, in fact, that's the contradiction. The fact is he can't love you any less than he loves Christ right. or he wouldn't love Christ as much as he does. Right. <laughs> Praise the Lord. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 13. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? So since... Christ himself isn't divided, neither can God's love for everyone united to Christ. It can't be be split up or portioned, or portioned, I should say, or or, or, or divvied out, meted out, allotted out somehow. No. He's not divided. So if he's not, the love can't be divided. It's the same for you as it is for me as it is for Christ. 
It's a God thing, praise the Lord. Amen. Look, God, God promised to love us as he loved the son. We read it just a little bit ago, right? Now, he promised that, did he not? Okay, look at 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20. All the promises of God in him are yea and in him, amen, under the glory of God by us. Any promise God made to us or to Jesus is still ours. Any of them and all of them. In him are yes, and in him, amen, or so be it, unto the glory of God by us. So how does that work? Well, by us embracing this truth, embracing those promises, believing those promises, it glorifies God because that's his intent. To show his love for us is as great as his love for himself or God in the flesh or his son Jesus, however you want to figure that. Praise the Lord. All right, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 6. <clears throat> to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. Praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. Somebody said, grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Grace is not a thing, it's a person. It's Jesus. So our unity with Christ is what guarantees us grace. Why would that be so? Because God said he would never leave us or forsake us. So there has to be grace to keep us. So that when we fail in the flesh, we don't offend. We don't separate. We don't alienate. See, until, you know, just until the unlimited love of God really takes root in our lives, until that captures our imagination, until our head knowledge of God settles into our heart through pure grace, nothing really changes. I'm not asking for a show of hands, but how many of you feel like I've been living this a long time, and I'm still failing. I'm still questioning. Not whether I'm saved or whether I'm going to heaven, but how does God feel about me today? How should I cry out to him? How, how can I when I know I'm messed up? Until we really embrace this and get it down into our heart. Things just don't change. Yes, you know, we're saved, we're going to heaven, but nothing really changes. We're just saved people all screwed up. Where before we were unsaved people that were all screwed up. But if we awake, everything changes. We can find rest in our lives. We can live confident lives. We can live courageous lives. It's safety of grace. And the scary freedom to be who we are, all that we are, more than we are, and not worry what anybody else thinks, how they're measuring, how they're judging, how they're critiquing, his beloved, his children. Man, when you're God's child, what do you care what the kid down the block thinks? Praise the Lord. Amen. As children of God... We're created in God's image. Yep. We're designed for and now defined by belonging, not just being. Our definition is we are one with God. We belong to God. There's a lot of people that have been orphaned by the church yep. or from religion trying to measure up, trying to work, work, work their way to Jesus. Trying to just find that closer walk. Yes, they are. No wonder we long for more. No wonder we feel anemic in our faith. Colossians 1, verses 26 and 27. Almost done here, guys. Colossians 1, 26 and 27. 
even the mystery which has been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory, made manifest in us. See, we, we've got to be, is what Sally was talking about. God has, just, this, think about it this way. And I don't know the theology of this, but it doesn't matter. It makes sense to me. God comes and dwells in us, and we dwell in him. Gives us the opportunity to see through God's eyes, to see Christ, right? To see the love of God in everybody. But it also gives God the chance again to be a human on earth and see through our eyes. See the beauty of his creation. Experience the, the interaction with other created beings. Yes. You know? Look, you think, well, why would God need that? Well, it must have been important to him or he wouldn't have done it. Right. He desi he, his desire is to be one with his creation. Yes. Yes. Is to see through our eyes. Yes. To experience life as a human filled with God. Just like our desire is to want to see the supernatural, to yeah. see the spirit realm. Yeah. And he gives us the glimpses if we will stay connected to the spirit. Yeah. God wants to express his individual love in our lives. He wants to make manifest this mystery of Christ in you. Psalms 8, 3 and 6. 3 through 6. I told you we were about there, and I wasn't lying. It's just that we're not quite there. Praise the Lord. Psalms 8, verses 3 and 6. When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Thou hast madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet. Yes. Praise the Lord. Yes. David's looking at the creation yes. like we do and say, wow, what a beautiful sunrise. Yes. Man, the ocean is so yes. humongous. It's so beautiful. It's so vast. It's so big. It's un unsearchable, you know. Oh, the Rocky Mountains, you know, and, and uh, you know, this thing and though this flower garden and all oh, these beautiful trees and the forest and so on and so forth and we're all freaking out about it and David says looking at all this what in the world does God see in us the apex of his creation the supreme reality of what he has created so the truth is God isn't only mindful of creation he's personally mindful of you. Mm -hmm. He wants to meet you in special, personal ways. Yes, he does. See, we, we make it about having this spiritual encounter. Mm -hmm. We make it all ethereal and freaky and weird. And God just wants to have an encounter with you. Yes. He just wants to have a special, up-close, yep. daddy-to-child hug yep. and show you something that you don't even know what to ask for. You know, we're asking for animal crackers. He's got the dairy cream, uh, ice cream cake. I don't know, pick your poison, praise the Lord. But you know what I'm saying? We're wanting little snacks, and he's wanting to give us the feast. We're asking for stuff that just, I, I imagine it confuses God sometimes. It's like the kids on Christmas. You give them these great gifts, and they're out playing with the boxes. I what they got, you know? <laughs> Praise the Lord. He's wanting to meet us personally. Because he sees each one of us as his special favorite child. Yes. Whom he loves to give good gifts to. Yes. Amen. Amen. Romans chapter 5, 8 through 11. God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. 
much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. I talked about this uh, Wednesday night, and I'm not going to go into all the detail of it, but just simply to let you parse this last word, at one meant. Atonement is simply us, by Christ, being made at one with God. It's at one meant. It's what we have. And we've made it about everything else when this is what it's about. Jesus not only serves as an atoning sacrifice for our sin. Jesus Christ is the at one yes. uniting us with God, making us yes. one. See, salvation isn't something, it's someone. Yes. It's Jesus. Wrap it up with these last two scriptures, 2 Peter chapter 1, 2 through 4. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. So we, we miss the point when we teach kids how to be good and to do, and I'm not saying we shouldn't teach them morality, we shouldn't teach them to be good, and we shouldn't teach them to pray and all these kinds of things, but I'm saying when the focus ought to be that they, as believers, they are one with God. There's nothing more that they need to be looking for other than to wake up to the reality of who they already are. They can lay hands on the sick and see them recover. They can cast out demons. They can do everything anybody else can. Yes. That's why an eight-year-old that's a believer can do the same thing an 80-year-old can yes. if they just know what they've got because yes. they had the same spirit. They had yes. the same oneness, the same right. reality in their life of God. Right. Amen. So grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. Let me read it one more time. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God, to your awareness, and of Jesus Christ our Lord, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue, yes. whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these promises, whom God has said yea and amen to, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, that you might walk in the reality of who and what you are, yes. having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust, yes. through human effort, through our desire to be elevated or magnified or whatever. Yes. Last scripture, 1 John chapter 5, verse 20. Just a closer walk. <laughs> we know that the Son of God has come and hath given us an understanding that we may know him that is true. And we are in him that is true, even in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Amen. He told me to walk this way. Yeah. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Yeah. Walk this way. Walk with this knowledge, and you never have to cry out for a closer walk with God, because you can't get any closer than you already are. His favorite, his spoiled, rotten, favorite, doted on child. Say praise the Lord and give him a hand this morning. Praise God. Praise God. God bless all you spoiled brats. Get out there and enjoy life for Jesus. Amen. Amen. You're dismissed in Jesus' name. Yes. Amen. Eric. Well, I, uh, I, I have an exhortation uh, for the church. And it's not a, it's not a bad thing. <laughs> it's not a bad thing. Uh, all last winter, just this thing just kept rolling through my spirit. It was all December. You know, after the election and everything. It just kept inside and just kept going over and over like a record, you know, that was broken if anybody was old enough to remember records besides me, you know. Just kept the old storm tossed and afflicted, oh storm tossed and afflicted. Mm. Just kept rolling through my spirits over and over and over. Mm. And, uh, I, you know, I thought, you know, it was just for this body here, you know. 
And uh, so as the, you know, as the winter went on, I kind of forgot about it a little bit. And then in January, for some reason, I was flipping through on my phone at work. And there's a guy I used to listen to. Uh, he's an he's a Indian guy, uh, Sandar Silverhaj. And this guy's a really interesting guy. Uh, but he said, he said, uh, and, it, and it came to me, well, it was a little before that. It came to me, so I, I looked it up. And one day, I guess I should say. And then I, I realized it was Isaiah 54, 11, 13. And so here I thought it was kind of a, a, you know, a bad thing. But then I realized, you know, what it really was. And uh, if you don't believe, if you don't mind, I, I, I got it right here in my phone. I'll read it. Sure. Uh, I mean, if Roberto wants to put it up on the thing, he can. Or somebody's back there. Do you want to put it up to 54? 54, 11. 11. Isaiah 54? Yeah. 11 through 13, you say? Right. 54, 11 through yeah. 13. Yeah, I, I mean, I'll read it right here out of the New, <coughs> new Revised Standard. But it says, O afflicted one, storm-tossed and not comforted, I'm about to set your stone Woo! in a timony, yeah. and I lay your foundations with sapphire. Yeah. I will make your pinnacles of rubies and your gates of jewels, yeah. and your wall of precious stones. Yeah. And all your children shall be taught by the Lord, and great shall be the prosperity of your children. Anyway, so, I mean, I mean, all of a sudden, it came to me. I'm like, man, you've been talking to me, Lord. I mean, this is about, you know, my thing for this next year, because all December is the end of December. And, uh, and, and it's, I mean, it's been coming, coming to pass in Sarah and my life and our business. Um, but anyway, I realized, I listened to Sandy Selvaraj, and he said, this is God's prophecy for the church, the scripture for the church for this year. And it's so interesting with the, with the election, you know, what's been going on. Because it has been storm tossed and you see tumult everywhere. I was walking to work the other day, and this is when I knew I had to say something here. Uh, and, and in my mind, I, w I was just kept seeing this. It was a woman. I couldn't see, you know, anything about who she was, what she was wearing, anything like that. But she was in water, and she was just tossing, just turning slowly. Like if you've ever seen a movie where somebody falls in the ocean, they're drowning, they're just turning slowly, you know. And, and you know, there's panic. And uh, so I guess the point about that is. Is that, you know, because we do not understand our righteousness and who we are in Christ, you know, the storms, the trials of life, you know, they got us yeah. and they spin us and they take us and we think we have no power and we're all, we're all looking. And I mean all, including me, and we're looking for an outside thing. So we're praying to God out there, you know, come rescue me. And God's like, let me come inside you and let's rescue everybody. Yeah. yeah. Praise the Lord. So. I think what, you know, what he's showing me is that, and all of a sudden, I guess in my mind, I'm sorry, I've, I've never done this to a whole body before, but in my mind, I'm sitting there thinking about uh, the disciples in the boat, you know, and, and how Christ was sleeping, and they're, you know, going crazy, they're freaking out, because here's the boat that's getting tossed, there's a storm, right? So the storm determined them, right? And the, the, the physical things happening determined who they were at that moment, because they were about to be victims of an accident. They were about right. to be victims and possibly die, right? Well, Jesus woke up and he said, I'm going to determine the storm. See, what he said is, the thing in me, God in me, is going to show you that I have dominion, I have authority. Right. And so God wants to put that. He's already done it. I mean, as Nathan says, and maybe the reason I'm saying this is because he just sees Nathan's exasperation, you know, because you're, you know, over and over, you, you keep hitting this thing in, yeah. from all these different directions. I think, you know, and then the next thing I saw was Peter walking on the water in my, in my, in my mind. I'm like, okay, so God gives us a glimpse, of, you know, in, in, in our emotions and in our spirit, you know, in our heart. We start to see God and we're able to get up on top of things and have yeah. dominion, walk in the water. But then all of a sudden our emotions, whatever, get us down and go back down in the water. Mm -hmm. And God's just saying, look, you need to have dominion. That means you're on yes. top. Like Jesus was, I'm not constantly plunging down, looking for a you know a life preserver, coming back up, plunging back down. Right. And so the thing is, what I'm what, what I'm hearing basically about this is that God just is like He says, people, you need to do some homework. You need to spend time with Him. You need to develop this concept of righteousness inside of you yes. and who you really are in Him. It can't yeah. be every Sunday coming, you know, and, and like you were saying, you know, I mean, dunking your animal cracker in the cream, you know, God, you know, this needs to happen. Yes. Yes. Just go home and you spend time meditating on the word yes. and understanding that concept and let God speak to you. Yes. Then we come back. We got something to release yes. here. Yes. And then there's got me. I think God's answered the prayers of what people have been crying out for here. Uh -huh. You know, and in the church that, you know, in this time, it looks like 
you know, things are tumultuous and going down. God, all he's doing is he's no, clearing no. up the junk. Right. And he wants to reset yes. and reestablish. Yes. Because you notice yes. he's going to set your foundation yes. on the truth and, and he'll build it right and build it glorious the way he wants to do it. Yes. And that's the reconnection of us with him as sons of God. But he's like, okay, if you want to be, you know, this work that's coming ahead, you need to be a son. You cannot be a baby, like Paul said. Right. You know, by now you should be teachers. But right, you should right. Be babies. Yeah. And so until we have that concept of righteousness, all this is like that old show Rugrats. You know, it's yeah. a bunch of little babies walking around and yeah. playing like they're adults, you know. <laughs> and so here, oh, let me heal you, Angelica. And oh, here, Peter, let me heal you. Buddy. And that's not it. God's like, he wants us to walk in authority and know who we are. Yeah. That's when you have boldness. That's when you're a lion. And that's what Jesus was. He Amen. He knew who he was. And he was not embarrassed. He was not ashamed. He wasn't talked down. Satan couldn't put, you know, a symptom on him, nope. you know, which is like a manifestation looking for an excuse. You know, right. hey, you're going to let me, you know, do this to you? No, he just, no. He, he knew who he was, and he walked in that authority, yes. and he's given us every spiritual yes. gift. He wants us to turn around and do the same thing. Yes. Amen. And that's the only way we can be effective. So anyway, Amen. there's a guy named D.W. Kenyon. He's got a great, I don't know if anybody's heard him, but he's got, there's a thing called Two Kinds of Righteousness. You can listen to it. It's on YouTube. He's got another one called Two Kinds of Faith. It's absolutely, I mean, when the guy wrote it, it's, it's, a, it's you know, it's amazing. I mean, you'll probably feel like, you know, it's Nathan talking to you on there because it's just like, it's, you know, the same kind of thing. And that's what God does. And so, so just keep bringing stuff around and around. But, I mean, I think God really wants people to spend time meditating yes. and start, because he wants to bring things up unless here, unless people want to dedicate themselves and respond back to the Spirit because the Spirit's moving. You know, it's going to move. He's going to move to the body of Christ. But unless we want to respond, we'll just sit and wonder, you know, and just keep praying. Hey, God, move. God, move. No, it's God's like, hey, I'm moved. I'm moving. Let's go. Amen. Amen. Okay. So it's like, uh, let me just say a couple things and we'll close this. But when you mentioned that about being the, the rug rats, you know, Jesus spoke to that. He said, you know, this generation, he said, like children playing in the marketplace.